the data is out there. So this isn't me like, oh, you know, in our properties, our rents are flatlining. It's like, no, throughout the entire country, rents are flatlining right now. It's no secret that real estate is one of the best investment vehicles out there. But how can we determine which strategies will best align with our financial ambitions? Well, you've come to the right spot. Whether you're an active real estate entrepreneur, a passive investor, or looking to get into real estate investing, our goal is to provide investors with the insights and strategies for building our portfolios all while protecting our capital. I'm Daniel Nichols, and this is the Two Smart Assets Real Estate Investing Podcast. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the show. I'm your host, Daniel Nichols, accompanied by our guest for the week, Axel Ragnarsson. And today we are the Two Smart Assets. For those not yet familiar with Axel, he is founder of Aligned Real Estate Partners, where they either directly own or have GP interest in over 450 units of multifamily real estate and has been a principal party in over $62 million worth of transactions. On top of that, he's also the host of the Multifamily Wealth Podcast, which is actually one of my favorite podcasts. We were talking about this a little bit earlier. But uh, so if you haven't checked it out already, go check out his podcast. Absolute fire. Highly recommend it. Axel, my man, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. And I appreciate the kind words about the podcast, but I uh, look forward to our conversation. Absolutely, man. You know, uh, yeah, it's it's an absolutely great show. I'm super excited about our conversation today. Before we dive into all the good stuff, though, man, let's hear more about you, your background, and how you got into real estate. Sure. So um, quick version is I, I currently live in Boston, Massachusetts. I grew up in New Hampshire, um, so I've always lived in the Northeast. Um entrepreneurial parents ran a wood chipping business. So nothing to do with real estate, but, uh, but it just a whole, you know, I was exposed to the entrepreneurial kind of lifestyle early on, um, was an entrepreneurial kid buying and selling anything I could get my hands on growing up. Um, never really had a job and in high school, early college, I was buying and selling cars. Like that was okay. kind of how I was making a buck. Um, realized that that was not a long-term plan. So I, I think I Googled one day, what do wealthy people buy and sell? <laughs> and I think <laughs> I came across real estate. So I uh, found bigger pockets, you know, through just trying to learn about real estate investing. And um, and that was really how I got into the business was, was I wanted to flip houses. But as I learned about flipping houses, I learned about multifamily real estate, rental real estate, and, you know, the whole idea of passive income and you do all this work to get a deal closed and then it pays you in perpetuity was all, you know, it was very interesting to me. So set off on the quest to start buying multifamily properties and, um, you know, started buying some small ones in, in college and shortly after I graduated and uh, built a portfolio of, of, you know, small to mid-sized multifamily properties that I was uh, kind of creatively structuring on my own. And, um, and then over the last couple of years, really starting in, you know, 2020, early 2020, started to get serious about raising money and scaling the business. Um, so we started scaling uh, in New Hampshire, which was kind of the local market an hour north of Boston. Uh, and then we started buying deals down in Central Florida as well. That was the other market that we really went heavy into uh, between Tampa and Orlando, kind of on the I-4 corridor. So started bringing in um, you know, passive investors, started sizing up the average deal size, and always stay true to the original uh, kind of vision, which was we're going to go off market. We're going to find deals at a really great price and try and de-risk this for ourselves and our investors. We're going to operate extremely well and um, we're going to provide a great investor experience. And that's really what we've built the business on thus far. And um, and a lot of other stuff happened along the way, too, where we started a property management company in New Hampshire to manage our own deals so we could bring that in-house. Uh, we also do some third party and um, and the business has been growing, making some hires, um, looking to continue scaling it. And over the last few years, we've bought um, over 400 units worth of multifamily real estate, where we're uh, the vast majority of those were the lead sponsor, lead operator, um, you know, majority GP interest holder, and looking to continue growing at a predictable and a safe pace um, into 2023, which I think is. A critical distinction. Uh, we want to grow wisely. So that brings us up to today. Hopefully that was quick enough. Yeah, absolutely love it, man. Uh, you know, quick rise there. You know, you've done quite a bit pretty quick. Uh, love to see the scale fast there. And also, you know, being ver having your own property management thing, I think is absolutely huge, right? Uh, it's, a, it's a real leg up. Love to see that you guys are doing that on your own. And, uh, you know, you mentioned uh, basically managing risk and going into 2023, being safe, have good investments. And that's kind of be kind of be what we're going to dive into today. So, um, you know, talk about how minimizing downside for, you know, risk for you, your investors in a turbulent environment, kind of like what we're seeing today, interest rates, all that good stuff and some of the adjustments you're making. So I know we have about five things lined up. We'll see if we can get through all of them. Um, but I think the first one is, you know, looking at today's prices, obviously there's a lot of things happening uh, with interest rates. Like I said, property prices, depending on what market you're in, they could be you know, it could be dropping, could be holding steady, whatever, right? Uh, but one of the things that you're kind of 
looking at is buying properties at a discount to today's price. So let's just start there, man. Let's dive into it. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, you know, it, it feels like common sense, right? Most people are like, well, of course sure. you want to buy at a good price, but I think it's easy to forget what that even means, right? And I think in the in the world of value add multifamily uh, real estate, especially the last three four years, people have been you know buying, understanding that there's a value add, and understanding that when they're done, there's going to be a margin, and that's how they're creating value, right? And for anyone that's gotten a bridge loan or some kind of construction loan and a value add project, you know that you have the as like the current appraisal of the property now, and then you have the as complete after you do the proposed work and and you look at the the pro forma. What's it what's it worth then? And a lot of people think that hey, if we have our project cost of $3 million, but the as complete says it's three and a half. Hey, we're buying a good deal. We're buying a deal at a discount, which I guess technically is true. But what I'm talking about is buying a discount to the t- to today's appraisal, to the current market value. If you were to buy the property, close it and sell it the next day, would you make money, right? If you were to list it and sell it, would you actually come out with a profit? So um, we're, we're placing a much more significant emphasis on our direct to seller marketing right now on really cultivating the relationships with new brokers um, in the markets that we're buying in, but also trying to maintain great relationships with the brokers that we have experience working with. And, um, you know, that's anything just increasing the frequency of communication or, um, you know, getting a little bit more competitive with our offers comparatively to the competition now, where a lot of people are just no longer willing to waive their financing contingency in today's turbulent debt markets, right? Um, That is something that we're still willing to do, right? So we can get into a deal at 80, 90K a unit that if we were to close and resell, it'd be 100, 110K a unit, right? So that's that's really our goal right now is I I know that we're going to figure it out on the as complete side, but I want to look at two days appraisal and I want to actually, you know, buy in markets that I know well enough to where I know if I'm buying it at 90, for example, I could list it the next day for 105, 110, and we're just de-risking the investment upfront the day we close. So what is what is that percentage? So if you're looking at a property, right, you want to see something, a discount on that property. What do you, you have an average percentage for 10%, 5%, 20%. What does it look like to you? I mean, I want to see typically 15 to 20%. Um, gotcha. I think if you're looking for more than that, you're probably putting yourself in a position to not do deals. I think, you know, unless you're really looking at small, like three to 10 unit deals or something like that, where you really can create a spread there. Um, we have built our off market deal funnel and our pipeline to that or to a point to where we can relatively consistently take down, you know, deals at 15% below market value. And for round numbers, that's, t- that's buying a deal at 85 grand, that's worth 100. Um, you know, per unit, I should say. So that that's kind of the minimum right now that that we're looking at. And when you and when you start to think about how the market could adjust from a cap rate standpoint, you know, if cap rates go up a hundred basis points, right? At least in the markets that we're buying in, and rents stay flat, assuming NOI doesn't grow, that that absorbs a lot of that decrease in asset value. Is you know, if you can buy at a price like that, and and it also just it removes a lot of the stress from an operational standpoint um, because you can approach it understanding that you have you have some room to play with, right? You can you can do a little bit more preventative maintenance to set you up for success as you as you hold throughout the lifetime of the deal versus just trying to do a lipstick on a pig type renovation because you have to really come in on budget type of thing. So that's that's kind of the number that we shoot for. And as time passes, I mean, honestly, it's you know. It's getting even. It's I, I want twenty percent nowadays as, <laughs> as interest rates continue to creep up, and especially now as we're recording this in early December of twenty, you know, twenty two, um, we're starting to see rents flatline in, in most markets, if not decline in some markets, right? So, so we, there's a real urgency in our end to to make that a core focus of our acquisition strategy. Yeah, I love love to hear that. Like you said, with that risk approaching, with you know interest rates rising, and you got rents kind of coming down in most markets, you got to be you got to be careful, right? And so, um, are you in the market you're looking for, like you said, you're in Florida, you're in New Hampshire. Are you seeing? Are you able to get the discount on these properties uh, that you're looking for, or is there one market better than other that you're having more success in right now? It's a little easier in New Hampshire than Central Florida because we're competing with less folks. Gotcha. Um, you know, the 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 folks that are buying up in New Hampshire and the types of deals that we're buying are are local buyers or they live in Boston or if they're a little bit farther out of state, maybe you get up to like New York City, right? Um, in terms of people seeking deals of some size. Um, Central Florida is just a more competitive market, I think, as as everybody knows. Sure. Um, you know, we're buying, we're buying typically in Lakeland, um, you know, kind of Hillsborough County, Polk County. Um, so between Tampa and Orlando, so we're a little bit, you know, we're inland, we're not coastal Florida, but even there is still a ton of competition. So we've just organically done more deals in New Hampshire because 
we think it's a little less competitive and we just have deeper relationships because I'm from there and we've been buying there for eight years now and, and all this stuff. So, um, so it's a little easier for us there, but, um, I'd like to do more in Florida. <laughs> I love, I love the Florida market, but I think, you know, we're kind of in a position where I want to take what we can get and, and I'd rather do a, a really good discounted deal in New Hampshire to today's value than something that's moderately discounted in Florida. Right. Um, just to, to kind of check that box. Yep, absolutely. And I think there's a lot of important things there. There's one really important thing I want to hammer on that, but I'll do that later because we you know we're going to get through these these other points real quick. So number one, uh, you know, buy properties at discount, especially today's pricing. Number two, we're going to dive into something more about debt, right? Because debt's super important. But before we get into that, man, you know, as the as the Fed attempts to, you know, continues to fight inflation as much as they can or whatever, right? Whatever your opinion is on that, uh, interest rates are going up. So how have you guys adjusted to the current rising interest rate environment? So, you know, again, it kind of ties into one, right? All these, all these will play together as we go through, but I sure. think, um, you know, we just, we just want to buy better, you know, we want to buy deals at a better price gotcha. and a better basis. Um, but I also, I also think that interest rates have gone up, but I think it's important to kind of audit like how we consider them going up. Right. And kind of that statement, I think we may have gotten used to like interest rates with, you know, in the threes and the low fours, depending on the type of real estate you're buying. And now, you know, we're we're under contract on a on a few deals in New Hampshire right now. We're getting quoted, you know, five eight five, six two five, six three five, you know, kind of in that range. That's still not that high from a historical context. Um, and honestly, in terms of looking at your cost of capital, like it's it's not completely out of whack, right? It's it's different if you're comparing it to what they were a year ago. That's there's a stark difference. But if you look from a historical standpoint, it's not completely out of line, right? So I think um that's how we look at it is interest rates are high. I mean, if they get to, you know, low sevens, high sevens, low eights, that's, you know, we're probably having a different conversation. Um, but as of right now, I mean, you know, our strategy has changed in the sense that we just want to buy better deals, but it hasn't really changed much beyond that. Gotcha. Um, and, you know, we have incredible relationships with our local lenders. I mean, we do a lot with local banks and local credit unions, given the average deal size that we do, which is usually a million and a half to, to, to 5 million, kind of in that range, small to mid size. Um, I think it has more of an effect on folks that are buying nine, 10, 15 million dollar deals where you're you're once you get to that asset size, you're almost playing like an arbitrage on rates versus cost of capital and, and, and you know, or I, I should say cost of capital to you know the cap rate on the deal. And and that market is I think is a little bit more effective because it's much more it's a much more efficient market than what we buy, which is usually we're buying 40, 50 units from a mom and pop owner, and we're buying with such a spread to the value that the interest rates affect it, but they don't affect it a real considerable amount. So we haven't adjusted what we do too much as a result of that, other than um, changing our strategy around the terms of the loan. So rates, one thing, I think terms are a whole nother thing. And we can you know gotcha. get into that if you want me to dive right into that. Yeah, absolutely. I was just going to roll into that list because, you know, as a passive investor, uh, you know, uh, for the last couple of years, really, uh, you know, going to these deals, a lot of the sponsors, always you see them taking out, you know, bridge debt, adjustable rates, all that kind of stuff. And over the last couple of deals that I've invested in, you know, just this year, you don't, you're not really seeing that anymore, right? There's been a complete shift, a different type of debt vehicle. So I know you, you, know, you can talk on that and the importance of fixed debt right now. So let's just dive into that, man. And we'll go from there. For sure. So, um, and when I say terms, I usually, the, the two things are, um, in terms of when does your rate start to adjust? How long is that fixed period? Uh, what is the term on the loan? You know, do you have an interest only period? And then from an amortization standpoint, right? Mm. So um, I'll just kind of run through. So we're only buying with fixed rate debt right now. And that's just a non-negotiable. Like I'm not, I'm not buying with anything that's adjustable rate. I I just don't want that stress. Um, that's just not something I'm interested in personally. Right. <laughs> so yeah, we buy, we buy fixed rate and then we we fix it for a minimum of five years. So I want to know that the, the day that we close, we have five years of payments that I can project and that I understand. And that really will take us a considerable way through a downturn if, if we if the market adjusts over the next couple of years. And it gives us a lot of time to plan ahead. Um, the other piece of that is just, you know, balloon, kind of the term on the loan. So I'm okay with five-year fix and then an adjust for the last five years, but I want at least a 10-year term on the loan. I don't want a five-year term, right? I want a 10-year term. And I especially don't want like a two or three-year term, which is what a lot of bridge products come with. Um, you know, if you look back in uh, right after the great front, you know, the, the, the GFC, right. Um, 2009, 10, 11, 12, right. the majority of the defaults in multifamily and the multifamily asset class were because of term defaults, balloon defaults. So loan came due at the wrong time. They were, you know, the owner was underwater or there was a break even type of situation. 
and they just couldn't get into a new loan product. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't want to worry about that. I want I want to just understand what I'm looking at for the next five plus years at a minimum. Um, and then from an amortization standpoint, like everything's thirty year am. I want to I want at least a couple of years of interest only. Um, I want to minimize my cost of capital for the first two years, especially as we head into a period of time where rents might start to flatline, demand might start to slow, and um, you know, that's kind of typical for the type of debt that you would get on these types of deals. So that's not, you know, anything too different than what we normally do. But whereas in the past, you know, maybe we would take a a 25 year AM or something like that in exchange for a higher LTV or some more construction financing or whatever. Now that's, I'm not interested in doing that anymore. Everything's got to be 30 plus. Um, and, and because we want to make sure that we're minimizing our debt service in the short term, that's that's the big priority. Is we want we want to prioritize cash flow. We want to make sure that we're not sending too much money out the door, whether it's into equity or just you know paying interest. Right, absolutely. And as we all know, as real estate investors, debt is probably one of the biggest deal killers that happens out there. Right, like you were saying before. So getting that right, especially in you know times of turbulence like we're kind of having right now and potentially having in the future, getting that stuff locked up and straightened up uh, at the beginning is absolutely critical. So appreciate you going to that level of detail. All right, so uh, number three, I thought I think this one is very interesting, right? Because as a passive investor, or just really as a person in general, if you're going into turbulent times. We really what you're doing is you're tightening your purse strings, really, right? You know what I'm saying? You want to have some more reserves, have it on hand just in case something something goes wrong. And it's the same with real estate investing, right? It's the same with owning a property. So you mentioned, I've heard you say this before, but you know, keep an adequate reserves on hand. So let's dive into that. Why is that important? And why should, you know, anybody be considering that as a real estate investor? Yeah, I think it's it's hard for a lot of people to do this right now because people have raised money over the last few years with the mentality that we want to. We want to tighten up what we need to raise so that we have a smaller equity amount in perpetuity to base our projected returns off of. And understanding that that's kind of what you had to do in order to to project the returns in order to entice the capital to invest, et cetera. Right. Unfortunately, we're heading into a situation where, I mean, the data, it's it, the data's out there. It's this isn't me like, oh, you know, in our properties, our rents are flatlining. It's like, no, throughout the entire country, rents are flatlining right now. That's the the data is abundant and it is and it literally states that it's very black and white. So if rents are flatlining, delinquencies are going up in class C in terms of collections. Um, you know, I'm not sure class B and A because we don't really invest in class B and A. We invest in class C. Sure. But collections are lower than they have been the last couple of years. Inflation is running rampant, which is going to make it more challenging for the class C tenant base to continue paying their rent because it's more expensive to buy gas and groceries, et cetera. So it's likely that net income will will start to to take a bit of a hit over the next 12 to 24 months at least in class C where we where where we primarily invest so raising reserve capital is extremely important um and it's also really important to understand that the the worst position to be in as a sponsor is to is to underraise and then you either have to personally fund you know make a make a member contribution or something like that or a personal loan which then you know puts you in a, a challenging spot as a sponsor right. from a liquidity standpoint um, that sucks. And obviously going out there and issuing a capital call is one of the worst things that it's like the, it's a nightmare for sponsors, right? Right. So put yourself in a position up front to, to not have to worry about that. And yeah, maybe you're projecting a 15 IRR versus a 17 IRR. Cause you're raising another, you know, two, three grand a unit in reserves or whatever the number is. Right. But communicate that to your investors and say, we're doing this to protect your capital. This is a measure to protect our limited partners interest in this deal and their capital because the worst thing that we can do is run this thing you know pretty lean and next thing you know we're we're not able to maintain the property effectively and and attract new tenants we're not able to work through our business plan in a timely fashion and actually get to a stabilized property faster right we're not able to consistently make distributions if you know our net income is a little bit lower in a given quarter than another than than what we projected so I think it's important to communicate that. Um, and again, if you are a sponsor, this is just an exercise in stress mitigation, right? And I sure. think that's like one of the best things that you could do is just not not just be stressed out when you're running these deals because a stressed sponsor probably makes less optimal decisions than one that feels comfortable with where they're at. Yeah. So it's it's the incentives are aligned across the board in doing so. Awesome, man. I'd love to hear that. And you're 100% right. You know, just having those reserves on hand is going to be massive. If if anything happens, right, you're going to be able to cover. And, you know, as a passive investor, capital call, like you said, that's not something you want to see. So uh, absolutely, if you're a sponsor, have some reserves on hand. So for you personally in your business, you know, uh, you keep an extra reserves on hand. Is there is there a number that you're shooting for 10, 20% more than usual, a multiple? Or are you doing $500 a door, $100 a door? What does that look like? 
So um, in terms of capital that we're strictly allocating for reserves, we buy a lot of old, you know, uh, early 1900s built properties. Okay. That's just the nature of the inventory up in New Hampshire. Um, sure. So we usually have more in reserves per unit than somebody who's buying, you know, like 1990s built class B housing in a southeastern city. Um, so we I mean, we typically raise, you know, 6K per unit in reserves. I mean, we, we raise a, a healthy amount because we kind of need it because there's a little bit more variance in the types of deals we do. Right. So instead of uh, raising the 6K a unit, which is what we did, you know, 12 months ago, now we're probably raising eight or 9K a unit. Um, and it's all in service of just just protecting the entity that's that's buying these properties, right? We're all investors in this company that's going out there and buying real estate that 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 company needs to be well-funded. That LLC needs to be well-funded. And um, our investors get it. They're like, hey, you know, we know that the projected returns might look a little bit different, but um, but I think people really care about their downside risk right now and as everybody should. And that's that's a way to protect that. Absolutely. Risk mitigation, number one thing right now. And, you know, going in, into a in the past investing, when I first started, the you know you hear it over and over, but really the number one thing is preservation of capital, right? I just want to make sure I go in and we can get that capital that I invested on the back end, right? It might not be great returns. Obviously, we want great returns, but definitely want the preservation of cash capital uh, to be number one. So love to hear that. All right, man. So uh, we're going to dive into number four. Um, and this is something that that I found very interesting, right? And I always find it interesting because, again, when I first started getting into passive real estate investing, I think every multifamily deal that I invested in, they projected a refi in year two or three, every deal, right? And you're just not seeing it. So, you know, one of the kind of one of the adjustments you said you make, and I've heard you talk about it again, is don't underwrite a refi in the first five years. Let's talk about that. Yeah. So again, like, you know, similar to the last one, it's, it's just what, like you said, everyone's done that for the last few years. That's the model. You do your value add and then in 18 or 24 months, you underwrite your refi and you sell in year five and that's how you arrive at your projected returns. Um, I think folks that are buying deals today, um, and I'll say, I'll, I'll put a little asterisk on this one. If you're underwriting a refi in 18 to 24 months at like a much higher market cap rate with like really aggressive debt assumptions, um, from like an interest rate standpoint, you know, you're projecting a really high rate, low LTV. Okay. I can see the argument behind doing so. Sure. Um, but I don't think that you should be underwriting a refi in 18 months, you know, or two years at today's market cap rate or the debt that you would get today or, assuming that there's been serious rent growth over the next couple of years. And I, and I honestly think that we, you know, I'm of the opinion that in, in the real estate market in a couple of years could look very differently, look very different than it does right now. And, uh, you know, the market dictates whether or not you are able to refinance, not your business plan, not how right. good of a deal you bought today. That's not up to you. You don't get to determine, um, you know, what the market does when you want to refi. So you can do your best to plan ahead. But I think right now, it's pretty, you know, it's prudent to just say, you know, we buy today, we hold for five years. What do the returns look like in five years, right? And um, and I think it's a little bit, it, it, it's easier to be optimistic about what the market does in five years because that's a significantly longer period of time. Um, so in our deals, we're just, we're buying today with our five-year fixed rate debt. We have our business plan. We, you know, we're going to spend our money on our CapEx so over the first year. We're going to get the rents to where we know we can get them to based on what we're getting today in a year. And then what does it look like in perpetuity beyond that? Um, and yeah, that's, that's aggressive, uh, you know, that's, that's safe, conservative underwriting, but it's, I, I think that's kind of, I mean, at least that's what I want to be doing <laughs> when, and, and when, that, we're, when we're taking down deals. Yeah. And I think the, 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 the thing that really strikes me, you know, as a passive investor, but even for you as an active investor, is like, it's, you can see it's a pretty straightforward strategy, right? There's not a lot of variance. You're not trying to do anything crazy. You're trying to, you know, there's a strategy there. There's a business plan. You're trying to execute it. And there's not this variance like, oh, we might refi in year two or three, but we're not even going to consider that because why, you know, there's no, really no reason to. So yeah. I think that's, I think that's great, especially as a passive investor, right? Just seeing that. Um, all right. Number five, this is something you kind of uh, spoke about uh, on your podcast, uh, kind of what you're focusing on. It's, it's actually focusing on smaller deals, you know, and it's something that I haven't really considered before in the past. Uh, but after hearing you talk about, it, I was like, oh, that makes a, I, I like that. That actually makes a, a lot of sense. So walk us through that. What are your reasons for focusing on smaller deals and times like these? Yeah, believe me, I'd, I'd like to keep trying to grow the business and doing, you know, keep doing larger deals. And, you know, as, as, as an ambitious real estate entrepreneur, right, that's, that's what I'd like to be doing. But I think the argument for focusing on smaller deals in times of turbulence is that you're minimizing the variables associated with the deal. Um, 
you know, and for example, I, I think that, you know, it, it should be focused on smaller deals plus in markets that you have a great team and that you uh, know yeah. really well. And I, that I, I just want to add that because it'll provide some context sure. to what else I say. But if you think about a smaller deal, right, let's just say a 40 unit deal comparatively to an 80 unit deal. If you're doing a value add on both of those, both of those assets, you're going to be able to get more of the, you're going to be able to get to completion faster on the 40 unit deal than the 80 unit deal. There's less units to renovate. There's less moving parts. You know, it's, it's one of those things where, uh, in terms of renovating a percentage of those units over the first 12 months, you're probably going to be able to do a higher percentage on the 40 unit deal than the 80 unit deal, unless you have an incredible team and you can do both at the same speed, but it's likely that you can work through the business plan on smaller deals faster. Um, and that's something that we care about right now is shortening the length of time that it takes us to get from closed to whatever our stabilized property is. So, um, you know, and that takes market risk off the table a little bit. Right. Maybe that still allows us to do a refi because the market is still pretty strong. Um, you know, we're, we're able to get to a point to where we have a great rent roll and we have a you know better NOI, we can continue making distributions, et cetera. So that's, that's one benefit of doing smaller deals. The other, especially for passive investors, is if you're investing with a sponsor that's taking down a smaller deal than what they historically have done the last you know three, four, five years, whatever it is, it's much more likely that they are able to personally cure some kind of issue from a financial standpoint if it goes sideways. Right. So if if you're investing with a sponsor that's only done you know mid-sized multifamily 40, 50 unit deals and they're under contract on a hundred unit deal, if that deal doesn't really go as planned, if if he's going over, you know, if the sponsor's going over budget. If the rents aren't growing at the rate he thought, if the NOI isn't there and, you know, there needs to be some cash contributed to the operating account, that might be too big of a deal for him to personally or that group or her or whoever to personally do a little bit of a member loan to 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 get you, you know, to bridge the gap or something like that versus the inverse. If in the, somebody usually does 100 unit deals and they're sizing down and doing a 50 unit deal, they're much more able to to contribute financially sure. to the to the deal and 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 you de you're de risked a little bit as a passive investor from that standpoint. So, you know, what we're doing now is we we were really trying to make 50 units our minimum. Um we're doing a lot of deals that are 20 to 50 units in size right now. We have a 23 under contract. Um we're closing a um well, we have a 23 unit portfolio. We're actually closing a separate 23 unit deal coincidentally and it's yeah, you know, it's just smaller than what we normally do. So we feel much more comfortable doing those deals. We can work through them faster. And if, again, knock on wood, something goes sideways, me and, you know, the partner that I have in that deal, we can, we can figure it out. It's, it's something that we have the capability of buying ourselves. So it's like there's, there's significantly less risk there. Um, and it's just, you know, from a, a risk profile standpoint as a sponsor, I don't want to be making big bets at a time where, I don't know what the market's going to do in two years, right? right? So that's the that's it on the sponsor side. So there's a few reasons there. And the last piece being, make sure they're in a market and in an asset class that you really, really understand um, because it only it only adds to the reasons I just mentioned, right? You want to do stuff that you really, really know at a size of which you can feel really confident that you can execute on. Yep. I'd love to hear that, man. And especially for, you know, whether active or passive, right? The one thing that really strikes me about this is if you're scaling down to even just smaller properties, or whatever, is that even in times like we're having now tur turbulence, whatever, right? You're still active, right? You're still taking down deals. And me as a passive investor, I always want to be investing. I don't want to take a season off, you know, if I don't have to. I don't. I just don't want that. I want to always be investing my capital as fast as I possibly can, keep that velocity up. So being able to come in with you guys and be like, hey, you guys got smaller deals? That's fine. It doesn't matter. We we're be able. To, you guys are being active, and that's what I want to see. So um, I think that's that's huge, especially from a passive investor standpoint. That is so. that is a great thing to mention, and I, I know we, we're running on time, so it'll be quick, but. Um... I appreciate you saying that because that I forgot to mention that. And that is huge as an active investor too. You have to stay in the game. It's really hard to just be like, oh, I'm not buying, you know, and then six months later, you try and re-enter the market. But people have been buying along the way and your connections might have gone a little bit stale and you have to you have to catch up, right? From a marketing standpoint or a, mark, a market relationship standpoint. Mm -hmm. And you, you're also, you're not in tune with what's happening in the market on a regular basis. If you're regularly transacting and you're taking a deal down every two or three months versus every six months, you have more of a pulse on really what's happening in the market at any given time. So that's a great point. And um, I'm glad you mentioned it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, man. I appreciate you going into this level of detail. So just in summary, uh, there's five five topics we topped on. Buy properties at discount to today's price. 
Use fixed uh, rate debt, increase reserve, your reserve funds. Don't underwrite a refi in the first five years and focus on smaller deals. I absolutely love these, man. And, you know, I appreciate you taking the time to go through these. These are something that, you know, I've, I heard you talk about these and I had to share them, right? It's just one of those things. So um, again, this has been fantastic, dude. Thanks for coming on the show. Before we get out of here though, tell the listeners how they can find out more about you and your business and anything else you have going on. Yeah, absolutely. So um, our real estate business is Aligned Real Estate Partners. Our website is alignedrep.com, short for real estate partners. Uh, if you'd like to get on our list where we send out our deals, um, alignedrep.com slash invest. Um, we have a pretty low minimum for most of the deals we send out. Um, we like to get a lot of folks involved. That's kind of our mission is, is we want to expose the power of passively investing to, to as many folks as we possibly can. So we have a slightly lower minimum than a lot of other um, real estate, private equity companies and firms, but, um, would love to connect with anybody out there listening. And if you want to just shoot me an email, um, and, and you know, chat it's Axel, A X E L at aligned R E P.com. Awesome. We're going to make sure to put all that stuff in the show notes. Uh, if you haven't checked out Axel stuff, go check him out, go check out Aligned. go check out his podcast. Absolute fire, dude. Thanks again for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Appreciate the invite, man. This was great. Hey, real quick before we get out of here, do me a huge favor and leave a rating and review for the podcast. We're always looking to bring you guys the best insights and strategies for building our real estate portfolios and your ratings and reviews really help with getting top guest speakers that are the best in the real estate investing business. I promise this will only take you a few seconds and I really appreciate it. Thanks for being awesome, guys. Cheers.